Well, thank you, Anton and Ricky and worship team for leading us in worship today. So good. My name is Pastor Brian Coffey. I am our South Street campus pastor. So usually that's where I am on Sunday mornings uh, speaking, but I get to be with you all here today at Kessinger Campus, and I'm glad to be here. Well, years ago, uh, or for many years now, I have had a small digital alarm clock next to my side of the bed. I actually gave it to my wife, uh, Lorene, way back when we were dating over 36 years ago. Now, I know what you're thinking. What kind of guy gives his girlfriend a digital clock radio as a gift? Well, I've always been kind of romantic in that way, so. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, it wound up on my side of the bed for all these years. Uh, I rarely use it as an alarm because I wake up kind of naturally early by myself. But as a clock, it was utterly reliable for all those years until... Just recently, uh, one morning about a month or so ago, I woke up and looked at my clock, and it said uh, 5.05 a.m., which is about when I usually get up. So I got up, started my morning routine, went downstairs, made the coffee, took a little short walk outside, came back, had some quiet time, and then went back into the kitchen, happened to notice the little digital clock over our microwave said 5.15 a.m. I thought, hmm, that's weird. I've been up a lot longer than 10 minutes, but I kind of forgot about it that night. Went to bed, I noticed my clock, and it was like 30 minutes or 40 minutes off ahead of where my, the clock on my wife's side was. And I thought to myself, hmm, that's weird. Reset it, and the next morning woke up, and my clock said like 6.10. And I never sleep that long. I looked at her side, and it said like 5.03, and I realized my clock had an acceleration problem. <laughs> really curious. So that night, went to bed, it was like two hours ahead. I'm like, this is really weird. And so I reset it again the next morning. So it kept doing that. And uh, finally, it got so far ahead that it was close to being right again. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, good. At least it's right twice a day. And I just looked at her side uh, for her clock to, get what, to know what time it was. And a couple days later, she uh, got me a, a new clock. Who knew? She's as romantic as I am. You know? <laughs> Well, the point of that little story is that my trustworthy clock was no longer trustworthy. By looking at it, I couldn't tell what time it was. I didn't know what hour it was. And today we look at a story about what time it is. It makes us ask the question, what hour is it in my life? We're continuing in our series from Mark's Gospel called Following the King. And we took last week off to do some vision and some celebrations. So let me do a little review where we've been. Uh, last time we were together studying... Um, this, uh, the Gospel of Mark, we saw that Jesus met with his 12 closest followers to celebrate the Passover meal. During that meal, he announced that one of them would betray him. During that meal as well, uh, they all asked, am I the one? Is it me? And we gave you little cards to remember that by. Uh, then Jesus took the bread and the cup, and he transformed the meaning of that meal forever. And then they sang a hymn together, Mark says, and went out uh, to make the 20 minute or so walk to the Mount of Olives. I know it's that long, so my wife and I and Pastor Jeff and his wife visited the Holy Land a few years ago. We made that very walk. It takes about 20 minutes. It was late at night, maybe 11 o'clock or so, dark. And along the way of that walk, Jesus tells his disciples that they will all fall away from him that night. And Peter speaks up and says, not me. They may all fall away, but I'll never fall away. I will even die for you. And all of them said the same thing. And that leads us to where we are today. We're going to pick up the story, Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 32. Mark writes, And they went to a place called Gethsemane. Let me pause there. Gethsemane was a kind of small park at the foot of the Mount of Olives. Um, this is the way it looks today. You see on the screen there. Uh, the word Gethsemane actually means an oil press. And it's believed that uh, this park was used for making olive oil. They would crush the oil, crush the olives, and it would capture the oil for cooking and so forth. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John. Now these three were sort of the inner circle that Jesus relied on at key moments in his ministry. And began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, this hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. 
And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they, they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The first uh, hour I see in this story that we're familiar with is the hour of prayer. The hour of prayer. I mentioned before uh, many times that my family has a long history at Taylor University in Upland, Indiana. Uh, my mom and dad actually met there as students in the 1950s. <clears throat> Excuse me, my brother Joe met his wife Karen when they were both students uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. I met Lorene, my wife, at Taylor when she was a student and I was working on staff. Uh, they actually have rules about that kind of thing now, but then it was kind of okay. <laughs> Two of our sons actually graduated from Taylor. On top of all that, Lorene's mother and all three of her uh, siblings uh, also went to Taylor. Uh, so we really should have a building there with our family name on it or something. And during my time at Taylor, uh, and I was there four years, uh, helping coach basketball and doing some other things, uh, I had two favorite places to pray. One was down by a small lake on Taylor's campus, and if you're uh, an alumnus, you know what I'm talking about. The other was uh, what was called the Old prayer chapel. It was in one of the oldest buildings on campus, just a small little musty room with like three old pews and a, a little altar up front and a small cross on the wall. And there were journals sitting in the pews where students would write out their prayers if they wanted to. And you could actually flip through and read uh, what people were praying. And um, I went off into that place. Something about that little room seemed just uh, special and kind of holy. It never really dawned on me how long that room had been there on campus and devoted to prayer until one time my parents came to visit and we walked uh, into the little, that little prayer room and my mom immediately recognized it from decades before. She said, I can't believe this room is still here. And then she looked at me and she said, I prayed you into existence in this room, she said. See, my mom and dad were married while students at Taylor and I was born on their first anniversary. My mom knew how to pray, I like to say. Verse 32, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Now we know from other places in the Gospels that Jesus made a practice of personal prayer, especially at important moments or before big decisions had to be made. For example, he spent 40 days fasting and praying in the wilderness before, in preparation for, the temptation of Satan. He prayed all night long before choosing the 12 disciples. He took Peter, James, and John uh, to the mountain to pray before the transfiguration. But here we have perhaps, um, I think, the most intimate and personal picture of prayer in the entire Bible. And we see a couple of things. First, Jesus went to a familiar place. We know from other places in the Gospels that this was one of his favorite places to pray. As John tells this story in his Gospel, he writes, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So he goes to one of his favorite places to pray. And by the way, it's a good thing, I think, to have a regular place for prayer, a place where you go, because I think place and, and consistency matters. And he goes there, and this time he takes the disciples with them, and he specifically asks his inner three, Peter, James, and John, to wait and watch with him. I think he's clearly asking these three men to pray with him and for him. But he also knows he must go alone before his father. And then the second thing we see is that the, he offers a prayer of great honesty and pain. Mark tells us that he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. He said, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. I wanna take a, a look at these words here because they're actually more 
powerful and heavy than we can read in, our, in the English language. The word translated greatly distressed carries the meaning of, of being astonished or awestruck. The word trouble means a profound kind of fear, to be overcome with horror. One commentator said uh, this, this describes the feeling you would have upon hearing or seeing a loved one being in a terrible accident right in front of you. Put them together, we get a sense of shock and pain, a kind of overwhelming and shuddering kind of fear. And this is something new. We've not seen this before in Jesus. To this point in the whole gospel narrative, he has seemed in control of everything. Nothing seems to surprise him. He's not surprised when he's confronted and, and when they try to trap him in his words. He's not surprised when he has enemies criticize him. He speaks matter-of-factly about his coming death several times. He predicts his betrayal. But now he says, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. The sense of dread and fear is so great, we read, that the weight of what he's feeling causes him not just to kneel in a posture of prayer, but to collapse on the ground in a desperate kind of prayer. Luke tells us, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The writer of Hebrews says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. So we have to ask ourselves, what could cause Jesus such inner turmoil, such fear and pain. Now, the easy answer, of course, is, well, the cross. Iron nails driven through hands and feet, crown of thorns jammed onto your skull, the physical suffering that is coming. But I don't think it explains it completely. And I think we see a hint in what the Apostle Paul would write a few years later in 2 Corinthians. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see that? God made him who had no sin to be sin. Now this is the theological doctrine called substitutionary atonement. That our sin requires judgment, but Jesus takes our place and absorbs the punishment that we deserve substitutionary atonement. Uh, many of you know my dad uh, was a pastor for some 60 years. He's uh, in a memory care facility now in Ohio. But uh, throughout our lives, early in our lives, he would pick a moment for each one of us boys to teach us this doctrine, substitutionary atonement. Uh, here's how he did it. We would do something wrong, something for which we deserved punishment. And instead of spanking us, he would have us spank him. Now, spank, my parents believed in spanking. They didn't do it a lot, but it was definitely in their parenting toolbox. I'm neither, you know, uh, encouraging that or discouraging that, but it was in our lives. Um, he, so he did this with each one of us growing up, with me, then my brother Joe, and then our, but when it time came for our youngest brother, John, who was about 10 years old at the time, uh, to learn this doctrine, um, John, he had done something wrong, and, and uh, my dad explained that, uh, he wasn't gonna, that he was gonna take his punishment for him. So he took off his belt, gave it to my little brother, who's 10. He took off his shirt, and he said, and he said I want you to, to hit me on the back with the punishment that you deserve. Now, my 10-year-old little brother just couldn't muster the strength or the desire to, 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 to whip his own father. And so my dad called for my brother, Joe, who was a senior in high school at that time. He said, hey, Joe, come in here. You got to help your brother. So he comes in. Now, my brother, knew, my brother Joe knew what, he knew what was up. He knew what was being taught here. Plus, he was 17 years old now. So he took the belt. And he whap, whap. And two red stripes across my dad's back. My dad reached back, grabbed the belt. And he goes, I think he's had about enough. <laughs> My brother says, later that day, my dad walked by him and muttered, you're a dog. Okay. 
Now, my dad's technique was a little bit uh, unorthodox, perhaps, maybe a little crazy, but uh, we, got, we got the point, substitutionary atonement. And I think it's right here that Jesus begins to get a sense of what it will mean for him to become sin. That Jesus' suffering for our sake begins here in the garden. Not a physical suffering, this was a spiritual suffering. That leads us to the second hour I see in the story, the hour of trust. The hour of trust. When one of our boys was about four years old, uh, we took a family trip to uh, Malaysia, Southeast Asia, to visit some of my, all my wife's extended family to see where she uh, spent much of her growing up years. And a few days after we got back to the States, this one son developed some weird symptoms. He got these welts and sores on the palms of his hands and the bottoms of his feet. It was just weird. So we took him to our pediatrician. He didn't know what it was. But since he, when he found out we had been traveling, he sent us to an infectious disease specialist at a large hospital in Chicago. Uh, when we got there, the doctor said it was possible that he had contracted a, a disease that could have implications for his heart. He's only four years old. But to know for sure, they had, would have to do an extensive blood test. So they needed to take blood from my little boy's arm. So I had him sit on my lap, uh, and before I had a chance to try to explain to him what was going to happen, this nurse comes out, and she's carrying this gigantic needle. I mean, it looked like, it looked like that, to me it looked like that big, I don't know what it looked like to him, it looked like a harpoon to him. And she comes out, and he begins to, to cry softly in fear. And then she says to me, sir, would you like to hold him, or do you want me to restrain him? And I said, oh, no, I'll hold him. And as she got close to him with the needle, he whispered to me, he said to me through his tears, Daddy, why are you letting her do this to me? He said. Now, how could I explain it was because I loved him that I had to let her take his blood? How could I explain? Verse 35, and going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Just one verse, but so much in this verse. We see Jesus' trust in his Father in at least four ways here. First, in the way he addresses God, he says, Abba, Father. Abba, as you might know, is an Aramaic word translated directly. It expresses the affectionate relationship between father and child. When we traveled to the Holy Land a few years ago, we actually heard several little children calling out to their fathers using that word, Abba, Abba. Father is from the Greek, pater, and it carries a sense of authority. So Jesus begins his prayer with both trust in the nearness and intimacy of his father, Abba, and respect for God as Father, respect for his authority. Now, interestingly, this is how the Apostle Paul describes our salvation in Romans chapter eight. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Second, we see Jesus expresses his trust in the sovereign power of the Father. He says, all things are possible for you. He has absolute trust in the power and authority of his heavenly Father. Third, we see that Jesus trusts in the goodness and wisdom of his Father. If you've been following along uh, our video devotional series, 23 Days with God, you may have heard uh, Pastor Joe Scavato's short devotional on the wisdom of God. It was, it was really good, as all of them have been good, but he described God's wisdom as being the intersection between God's complete knowledge and God's absolute goodness. So God's wisdom is the combination of his knowledge and his goodness. And because our Father has all knowledge and because he's completely good, we can trust his wisdom. Now, I think we need to notice something rather subtle here, but important. Jesus doesn't allow what he's feeling to distort what he knows to be true about his father. That's significant. Jesus doesn't allow what he feels in the moment to distort what he knows to be true about his father. And that's significant because our modern culture teaches quite the opposite. Our modern culture today teaches us that what we feel is what is true. 
Therefore, if I feel something is right, it must be right. If I feel something is wrong, it must be wrong. If I feel lonely and, and abandoned, it must, be, it must be true that God doesn't exist or doesn't love me. This is sometimes called emotional reasoning and, reasoning and is dangerous because it locates the source of truth in me and what I feel and what I want rather than in a transcendent and eternal source of truth, God the Father. So even though he's in a moment of extreme pain and distress, Jesus trusts the truth about who his Father is. And then we see Jesus prays, remove this cup from me. We have to take a a significant side trip here. What is the cup? What is the cup that Jesus is asking to be removed from him? It's the cup of suffering, but even more than that, the cup points to the wrath of God, what the Bible calls the wrath of God. Psalm 75, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Isaiah 51, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. So throughout scripture, the cup is symbolic of the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Now, I know there are probably some of you here, maybe watching online, that uh, if you're honest, you have a bit of a problem with the wrath of God. I know many people have a problem with what's called the wrath of God. They say, well, I don't really like the idea of an angry God. That's, that's got to be an Old Testament thing. I'm a New Testament kind of person. Or my God is a God of mercy and love, not wrath. But here's the thing. If we reject the wrath of God, we also reject the love of God. Let me say that again. If we reject the wrath of God, we also reject the love of God. One of the only times I've, I saw my dad really, really angry was when I was about 13 years old. My younger brother, Joe, about 10, our youngest brother, just a toddler. Uh, we got, we'd gotten hold of some firecrackers and we had the brilliant idea to use the firecrackers to attach them to our model airplane so we could blow them up in the yard. And so we were working in my room. We had a car table set up. We had the model airplanes. We had the firecrackers. We found one of my mom's candles, lit it. We're melting wax under the model airplanes and sticking the firecrackers on there. Okay, you know, we had model airplanes, firecrackers, and a light open candle. Flame. What could go wrong, you know, in, a, in a, that situation? So we were doing this, and we didn't notice our little brother, who was about two years old at the time, toddled into the room and was, was watching what was happening, and we were, we were busy at our work, and he took one of the firecrackers and held it into the open flame. Oh. Mm -hmm. I heard the fuse burning. I looked down. My little brother's got this live firecracker in his hand. I grabbed it out of his hand right before it went off and exploded in my hand and numbed my fingers like that, but the bang of it made my little brother cry. So he's screaming, my dad hears his screaming from downstairs, runs upstairs, takes one look at what we're doing, and he was not happy, let's put it that way. And his anger was completely justified because it was an expression of his love. What kind of father would look at that scenario and go, huh, whatever, do whatever you want to do, All right? Or imagine how you would feel if you saw one of your own children being bullied on the playground. Or imagine what the whole world feels right now watching the destruction and death in Ukraine day after day. The point is there are times when love demands wrath. Tim Keller writes, the more loving you are, the more ferociously angry you will be at whatever harms your beloved. God is infinitely more loving than we are, and therefore infinitely more wrathful when he sees injustice, evil, and sin in the world. Keller goes on, your conception of God's love and of your value in his sight will only be as big as your understanding of his wrath. Now, I don't think we can fully comprehend or imagine what it meant for Jesus to face the burden of the wrath of God. Paul says Jesus was made to be sin. Think about that just for a moment. It means that Jesus took on himself not just 
my sins or the failures of your life, which are plenty, the collective failures of the people in this room or those watching online, not just the collective sins of all four of our campuses, uh, not just the collective sins of each, everybody who lives in the Fox Valley or in Chicago or in Illinois or in the United States of America, but the entirety of the sin and evil in the history of the world, the Holocaust, Ukraine, human trafficking, every murder, rape, and genocide the world has ever known, the cup of God's wrath is poured out on him and the crushing weight that drives Jesus to the ground in prayer is the wrath, the coming wrath. This is what causes him such fear and anguish because he knows in that moment he will be separated from the Father for the first time. Keller writes, Jesus began to experience the spiritual disintegration that would happen when he became separated from the Father on the cross, and he staggered. Finally, we see his trust in his surrender to the Father's will. He says, yet not what I will, but what you will. And here's the culmination of Jesus' hour of trust. Mark tells us Jesus returned to prayer three times that night. We don't know for how long, doesn't tell us, but long enough for those disciples to fall asleep three different times. We'll see that in a minute. Jesus prays in and through his pain and fear. He's honest before the Father. I think he feels the weight of what's coming. And on top of all that, I think he knows a sense of temptation there in the garden. In Luke's telling of the temptation of Christ, he ends with this verse, Luke 4, 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now, we don't know from Scripture when that happened. I think it's possible that opportune time is now in the garden as Jesus pleads, remove this cup from me. I think it's possible he hears the whisper of his great enemy. You don't have to do this. You don't have to go through with this. You're the son. The father can find another way. But Jesus prays until he comes to the place of trust. Yet not what I will, what you will. And that leads us to the last part of the story, which I'm calling the hour of temptation. Verse 37. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. So Jesus knows what's coming for Peter and for the others. He knows their time of testing, their time of temptation is coming right around the corner. And personally speaking, when does temptation come for us? When does temptation come? I think temptation comes when we are tired when we're physically tired. By now it's maybe two in the morning. Peter, James, and John are, are, are just tired. They're used to being asleep by now. They wanna stay awake with them, but they're tired. By the way, this is how Satan first tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. He's hungry. Satan tempts him with bread. I think temptation also comes when we feel emotional pain, when we feel things like fear, Jesus has spoken of betrayal. He said they will all fall away. I think these, these men are sad and they're confused. Temptation comes when we are spiritually tired as well, when we're spiritually sleepy. Remember, Peter had just hours before said he was willing to die with Jesus, but he wasn't prepared James and John had uh, a, few, a, few, a few weeks before demanded positions of honor in his kingdom to sit at his right and his left, remember? And they claimed to be able to drink from the same cup, but they are now all sleepy and asleep. Verse 41, and then he came to them a third time and said, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So three times Jesus goes off to pray. Three times his best friends fall asleep. Now he simply says, it is enough. The hour has come. 
Jesus has cried out to his Abba from a depth of anguish and pain we can never know. He's come to terms with the coming wrath. He's surrendered to the goodness and will of the Father. And now he says, it is enough. In other words, I am now ready for the hour that has come. So the question I wanna to ask today is, what time is it? What time is it? What hour is it for you or for me? Is it your hour of prayer? What burden or fear or pain do you carry right now? Are you willing to go to your place of prayer, to your Gethsemane, and pour out your heart and soul to your Abba Father? Is it your hour of trust? Do you know that your Abba Father is able do you know that he is good? Do you trust his will? Are you willing to surrender to his will? Or is it your hour of temptation? Are you tired, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually? Have you become, you know, sort of spiritually sleepy? Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus has spent an hour, maybe two, in the anguished prayer before the Father. And now his betrayer has arrived. Jesus knows what's coming. He says, it's enough. The hour has come. He is now fully prepared for what is to come. As one writer puts it, the victory of the cross was one in the garden. The victory of the cross, and we'll get there, was won in the garden. The question for us is, what time is it? Would you bow with me as I pray? Lord, we thank you for this beautiful and heartbreaking story. Well, we're familiar with it. Many of us have heard it often throughout our lives. But we struggle to wrap our minds around the depth of your struggle in the garden. Help us to understand how, th how we thank you for bearing the wrath that each one of us deserves. And teach us to trust the goodness and will of our Abba Father. Teach us the power of surrender. Teach us to watch and pray and stay awake that we may be fully prepared in the hour of our trial and temptation. It's in your name that we pray today. Amen. Our benediction today comes from the New Testament letter called Jude, verses 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.